welcome to the Pseudo Show brought to you by Tux Digital. Today is another installment of Pseudo Show Careers. I asked a familiar voice to come on the show to talk about his journey to technical product marketing. All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. I'm Brandon, and this week is our next installment of Careers in Technology. Technology careers have several different paths. There's the two main traditional paths that people think of, an operations path and a developer path. But there are other roles as well, such as technical product managers and technical sales. It's the area I'm in, just to name a few. Today, we're going to talk about the path one of our fellow technologists took to become a technical marketing manager. To talk about this, I asked Eric Hendricks to come back and talk about his journey. Eric is also known as the IT guy. Eric and I launched the Pseudo Show nearly two years ago, and he stepped away from the Pseudo Show to concentrate on his new role at Red Hat. If you happen to not be familiar with Red Hat, Red Hat is a leader in open source enterprise solutions and hybrid cloud technology. And Eric is a senior technical marketing manager for Red Hat's flagship product, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love. Get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful comp- cloud computing. Get growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by third-party security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash DLN and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. Eric, glad to have you on the pseudo show. This time, you're my guest. I'm glad to have you back on. I, I got to say, this is this is really weird for me. Uh, I, I haven't recorded the intro in months uh, but uh, I'm I'm glad to glad to jump on and and uh, and chat a little bit about uh, careers today. I kind of uh, intentionally aligned it like this. This is episode 50, and I wanted Eric to be a part of episode 50. I'll probably bring him back on for our one year anniversary show, which will be in uh, June. Uh, two years, two year anniversary, yeah. sir. <laughs> Gosh. 2021 and 20 and 2020 merged into one year. Mm-hmm. It just was a 24 month mm-hmm. year. Agreed. So uh, anyway, yeah, it, w- it's been a ride. I've had some great guest co-hosts step up and it's been a, uh, we definitely miss you, uh, Eric. I, th- I think maybe, I think the audience might miss you more than, uh, than me, but. <laughs> well, I definitely miss our, our audience and I'm, I'm still around. Um, I, uh, I, I do listen to uh, to every episode. Brandon and I uh, kind of collaborate on the on the back end, and uh, and and as Brandon mentioned, we've got several episodes, at least even in this calendar year, where uh, where I'll be I'll ju- I'll be jumping on. We never really said that I was leaving the show because it, we weren't sure if it was going to be a temporary thing or more more of a longer term thing. But uh, 
one of the one of the drivers behind it was we wanted to kind of refactor the show a little bit and i think the new content's been working out great but uh, it freed up some cycles for me because ironically tying into our topic today i needed to spend some more time actually building a couple of other a uh, couple of other shows uh, these these are red hats uh, official red hat shows we've got 3 right now We've got Rel Presents that is live on Twitch and YouTube every other Wednesday. We cover uh, product topics for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We, uh, we've we had uh, Carl George of the uh, CentOS Stream and Apple Repository. We've had uh, Matthew Miller on from Fedora. Uh, so we... It was a good one. Oh my one. gosh, it was so much fun. I really liked that one with Matt. <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw it, but I had to turn down the... Uh, I had to turn down the mic... Turn down my mic. I was so excited. I was... I was peeking my microphone at the beginning, uh, but uh, so we, we cover product to- topics uh, like new releases. We we cover some of the upstream community news. Uh, we're hoping to do a little bit more of that over the summer. You know, take kind of take a step back from deep technological topics and and do do something more community focused. And we also do some day in the life stuff at uh, at, at Red Hat. What it what it's like to be uh, someone who who actually develops an operating system in an open source uh, in an open source way. So love Rel presents. It's it's probably my my favorite thing I do every other week. Uh, we've also got into the terminal, which is an admin one hundred and one kind of approach to systems administration. Whether you're new to the terminal or new to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, where we talk about just very basic processes on on how how do you do certain tasks, whether that's disk management, SE Linux, or or uh, insights. Uh, so into the terminal is every Thursday, and then uh, we've also got one. We've got a mini series coming up over the summer uh, that uh, that is going to cover insights for RHEL. So if you're a Red Hat Enterprise Linux user uh, or thinking about becoming one, uh, insights is a tool that proactively helps monitor your infrastructure. Uh, and it's amazing. If you haven't heard of Insights, go check it out. I don't have dates or times yet for uh, for the mini series, but we're going to launch that post summit at some point over the summer for a eight to ten episode uh, mini series on Insights. Cool. Uh, so it's not like I haven't been around to that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You, you've been doing a lot. Yeah, taking a step back, I, I, I get it, especially with all that going on at work. Day job always takes priority over the podcasting hobby. Well, and and the funny thing is. All the lessons that Brandon and I learned building this show from nothing up into up to fifty episodes now, uh, pretty much all of those lessons uh, I've I've taken and applied to the Rel BU uh, to to the Rel uh, business unit. So it it flavors a lot of my approach uh, when it comes to doing live streams for for Rel. It's uh, it, I, there's a lot of pit, pitfalls and lessons learned from the pseudo show that I was able to take to the office. So it's to me, it's to me, it's not community versus uh, versus work. To me, it's how do we take some of the things that the community has done well, things that Destination Linux Network and others are doing well, and how do we bring an enterprise grade operating system back to the community? We we talk about our upstream uh, distribution model or development model all the time, but if if there's no visibility, if there's nothing going on that kind of ties those two worlds together, then we failed. Uh, so I've I, I didn't see it as, as dropping one to 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 do the other, uh, yeah. but just kind of bridging the two worlds and trying to trying to be more active on some of uh, some of the other podcasts like Pseudo Show, Destination Linux, uh, anywhere that uh, that they'll have me on and, and let me ramble on for an hour. Well, I, well, again, maybe, maybe the audience is, is happy I haven't been on with all that rambling. <laughs> That's entirely <laughs> possible. Oh, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> So, Eric, I, I wanted to bring you on to talk about careers. I, I'm start a series, start with Neil. I'm going to be doing more, eventually one with me. Uh, tables will be turned and someone will interview me. I'm, we'll figure that out at some point. Ha- have Neil and I on at the same time. We'll, we'll tag team you. We'll see oh if boy. we can make Brandon cry by the end of uh, the episode. <laughs> uh, the Destination Linux crew is already threatening that. So, <laughs> we'll, uh, I'll, uh, so we'll, 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 uh, we'll figure that one out. And one of the thing, one of the things I wanted to get out of this, I don't want to call it an arc because it's not, it's an ongoing here and there type of to part of the series uh, of uh, this year, where I want to basically dispel the myth: to be in tech, you need to be in a technical focus mm-hmm. role. There's so much more to technology than just writing code. 
building systems, administrating RHEL or OpenShift and or other Kubernetes platforms. There's project management roles. Most project managers are not technical. And then there's in the case of like a product company like Red Hat, there's also marketing mm-hmm. roles. There's uh, product management roles, but there I haven't talked about this like in technical sales. There's two halves. There's count rep, the non-technical person, and then the uh, solution architect or sales engineer, or some people like to call it the conscience. <laughs> At least at Red Hat, I don't know about other companies, we have kind of the same model for our product team, Mm -hmm. for technical, for our marketing team, where there's a product manager, they may or may not be uh, at least have some sort of technical background. And then there's the uh, technical product managers, which is, you know, their counterpart, uh, they're very deep technically. And we have the same, and then for marketing, we have the marketers, and then the technical marketers like Eric. So people that are have an interest in, in technology, maybe they've just are burned out from system administration or development, but they want to get into some, they want to stay in the technology field, but want to do something different. They've always had an interest in marketing like Eric did. So that's one of the things I, I want to get out of this series. So let's go ahead and dive right into it, Eric. Your background, mm-hmm. I just almost like a job interview here. When did you first realize that you had a interest to get into technology? Or or was it like, oh yeah, this was uh, something I knew I could make some money in down the road? So first thing I'll say is if you're trying to get into this field for the money, don't. It's not worth it. I know a number of very technical, technically savvy people that have gotten into this field and don't have a love of technology, don't lo- have a love of building something or implementing something, and they just see it as a way to make money. There's so many easier ways to make a living, to make a career than choosing information technology. I don't know what any of those are, but to me, money isn't and never has been honestly a factor in what I do. Strangely enough, a lot of my income goes back into technology, <laughs> whether that's buying something for a home lab or or making sure that the family has the latest uh, latest toys. My 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 technology salary enables that uh, that interest, that hobby, that uh, yeah that 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 interest. But for me, I was probably about four or five when I first started get, getting an interest in technology. We had a I think it was an Apple II that uh, that we had in in the house for um, my dad was doing publishing at the time, uh, and so he had he had uh, an Apple uh, computer that uh, I, I remember it, it came with one meg of RAM, one meg with an M, and it cost us like fifteen hundred dollars to double that to two meg of RAM. So one of the one of the first uh, one of the first talents I I developed as a uh, as a desktop engineer was um, being able to change my dad's background. So one of the first things I ever did was figuring out you could actually change the 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 black and white uh, background on on uh, on the uh, on the desktop. Ever since then, I'm, I got into things like like Star Trek and and I loved the technology and the advancement that that uh, technology had taken in in its science fiction form and then learning that things like Star Trek inspired real technologies that always was exciting to me, not just as a Star Trek fan, but uh, as someone who had a growing interest in technology. So, I mean, just that, that just grew. And, and so technology was always in the background of elementary, middle, and, and high school. Um, in fact, I, I bought a Palm Pilot uh, my senior year of, of high school, and I remember getting in trouble in the science class because my best friend and I were playing uh, hearts on my, on my Palm Pilot. I know a bit about your background. I mean, we've been friends for years now. Your journey to technology, I know you went to school, but you also were considering a completely different path, which was uh, uh, lighting design. And uh, yeah, tell me about your like, your thoughts uh, on that, like your lighting design mm-hmm. what and what led you to do something like it's probably more technical than people realize and also what you did to get those gigs i mean this goes into the marketing uh, space as well yeah, so actually the my my uh, my moonlighting as a lighting designer actually helped uh, helped set us up for success to launch the pseudo show because i learned a lot of lessons from that and then uh, then of course pairing up with destination linux network just put us over the top and 
Uh, so thanks to, to Michael and Ryan for, for hosting uh, Pseudo Show for the past 50 episodes and beyond. Uh, but uh, actually, my, my first career choice was not in technology or in, uh, in, in the entertainment industry. My first career choice coming out of high school was actually going to be a pilot in the Air Force. And I was in Air Force ROTC, and I was wrapping up my first semester as a freshman, and I'd, I'd passed a lot of the written tests that I needed to to, to go down the pilot track. And then I shattered my kneecap. And so that, that took about five years of recovery, of rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the muscles around it. And that, that was a long and literally painful journey. But, uh, but it kind of, uh, kind of wiped me out for, for going into the Air Force as a pilot. I actually didn't know that. When I first met you, I actually was, because you're, you're a little bit shorter than I am, not, not a lot. <laughs> you are like the perfect height for a fighter pilot yep. like they're not that like those uh they're like basically if you're between five six maybe five four that's a little short but five six and five nine is like the the sweet like that's the sweet spot for a fighter pilot. so yeah exactly in fact i cleared it by half an inch i am an imposing five foot four and a half and uh uh, and so I, I barely made the, the height requirement to be a fighter pilot, but, uh, yeah, they, they, they prefer shorter and skinnier guys, but, uh, yeah, so that, that doesn't feature in my story very often, but, uh, you, you mentioned first career choices. Um, uh, but, uh, after, after, uh, I left the university of Missouri, Columbia, um, I, I came back to Kansas city and I went to DeVry and got a degree in network communications management. Uh, started out um, started out my career like a lot of us do, uh, working help desk as an intern, and then I got a full time gig as a desktop support engineer, which is code name for the guy who goes and kicks printers when they don't work, or replaces desktops when uh, when someone spills their uh, their coffee and and uh, and mocha lattes all over the keyboard and monitor and everything else. Uh, I kind of worked my way up from there uh, into server administration, uh, predominantly in Windows environments, uh, though the the five or six random Linux servers that some of the first companies I worked at had, uh, I, I would volunteer to, 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 uh, to, to log in and, and manage those just because it was something completely different. Um, Windows and I never quite got along. And... Uh, any of you out there that have ever had to d deal with uh, group policy know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, uh, so around 2011, I think it was, um, I, I decided that I, I was ready to kind of move to the next level of, of my career. And uh, I literally was at a bookstore one day for over an hour. Uh, bookstores are, are this place that with four walls and a roof where you used to go to buy physical books with actual paper made from trees. <laughs> but uh, uh, I literally sat there with a Windows uh, server certification study guide and uh, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, RHCSA study guide, so the Certified Systems Administrator study guide. Uh, and I, I kept going back and forth looking, looking at both of them. And ultimately, I just decided to double down on on Linux, and uh, so I started studying. I managed to get a job uh, full time uh, for a company here in Kansas City uh, as a systems administrator, and <coughs> shortly thereafter, got my RHCSA. I'm still bummed because I missed my RHCE by two points. <laughs> I need to go back and get that, but uh, that's that's a conversation for a different day. Um, and since then, I've I've been a full blown uh, full-blown Linux user. I've uh, been on and off Linux as a desktop. I, I run Linux on my home server lab. Um, I spent about 10 years doing systems administrative work. And towards the end of my, my time as a sysadmin, uh, that's, that's when I started getting involved in the community around some of the different podcasts. In fact, Brandon and I got to know each other because we started hanging out in all the same places, um, like, uh, like mumble rooms and, and telegram chats and so we just started a conversation, and uh, and uh, it was actually Brandon that encouraged me a lot to uh, to pursue uh, my my interest in in the community. Um, so started dreaming about a podcast, uh, which three or four years later would culminate in the creation of the Pseudo Show. Uh, but uh, but before that, I actually transitioned out of operations and moved into uh, technical sales. 
So I was a solutions architect for uh, GitLab. Um, thank you to uh, to uh, move to get the move to GitLab uh, movement uh, when when GitHub. I think it was when GitHub got bought by Microsoft. Uh, gave gave GitLab the uh, the boost that they needed to to hire a lot more. So I went on as a solutions architect working with uh, with account teams for mid market. So small to medium sized businesses. Uh, I was there for about a year when Brandon actually called me up and said, uh, hey, we've got a position and it sounded just like you. So why don't you put in your application to Red Hat? Well, let's dive into that a little bit more. So I get it. I was uh, in ops for a long time. Burnout in ops is easy Constant to do. firefighting. And, and yeah, and you, and you think like, oh, I'll quit and go get the next job. But it's the same thing. Really, it, it didn't, it, you didn't have time. The only time you have to like recover from the previous gig is that ramp time to understand what's going on at the new right. gig. <laughs> and then, it, and then it just happens all over again. Yeah. I mean, if you look at my resume in the mid 2010s, that's what it looked like. It was a couple of years here, a year there, and a couple of years at another company, this contract gig and that contract gig. And, and to your point, that's that's when I got into lighting design almost as a, as a hobby. I was volunteering at my church uh, doing com- basic like computer, uh, computer maintenance type work. Uh, and there wasn't much of that to do. So I actually got... Uh, got cornered by one of the worship leaders and they, they asked, Hey, can, uh, can you help out the production team over the holiday season? It's like, well, I don't know anything about audio engineering or, or lighting design, or I, I, I know what a video camera is and I know where the big red button is, but I mean, I don't know how much help I could be, but we were, it was a portable church at the time. Uh, so we had to set everything up, run every cable, hang every light, get every camera angle back to the way it usually is. And then after a couple of services, we'd tear everything back down again. Um, so I actually uh, got plugged into the lighting team because the director uh, was a software developer. So he knew how to translate lighting technology into terms that I would understand because the DMX protocol that drives a lot of the lights you see at concerts and, and at theater venues uh, is just basically a dumb network. I mean, it's like, I, I'd liken it to almost UDP traffic. It just, the, the lighting controller just spits out all this, all these, uh, all these values and certain channels with certain values make the lights do certain things. And so it just made a lot of logical sense to me. And, and I don't, I, I've always been a music junkie. Um, so this was a chance to kind of, kind of combine the creativity of music with, uh, with my love of technology and a technology career. Uh, so I'd, I actually bought my own console. I had my own lighting rig and metal aluminum trussing uh, and was doing uh, was starting to do different concerts. Um, and uh, so I've, I've worked uh, some of the big festivals here in Kansas City. I've, I've worked the Midland. I've met various country artists uh, uh, doing different things like that. Granted, that started to, to die off as, as I got a little bit older, had a family, and then any dream of that ever happening uh, full time was <laughs> was kind of crushed after uh, 2020. Um, but uh, it was something I really enjoyed. And about the time that Brandon and I met, uh, back to your point from like eight minutes ago, <laughs> um, I, I'd had this I'd have this idea of doing technology consulting basically hiring a windows guy hiring a networking guy being the linux guy and and working with different small to medium sized businesses here in Kansas City and being their IT support team um, so they'd have one place to to pay someone who didn't necessarily have the resources to hire a full blown team because even within networking you can have a security guy you can have a networking guy you can have an internet facing guy uh, same with linux or same with server administration you've got You've got the storage guy. You've got the backup guy, and the the smaller the organization, the more of those hats that individual administrators have to wear. So I, I'd had this vision of, uh, you know, what if what if I basically assembled a team of of technologists that had different experiences, and then we could just prov- we could just market ourselves as we're your, we're the only IT uh, hire that you need to make, and and part of that would also be to provide live events support. So if, if you needed a DJ and some guy to run a soundboard for, for your company holiday or something, 
um, then then uh, that either be like a separate division of of my company or uh, in my case, you know, people that just can never get their hands off of technology, whatever form that takes. You know, I'd be the Linux systems guy and the lighting designer for the live events. Uh, so that was that was kind of the dream I'd had. And I, I still flirt with that idea every so often. But when you have four kids, you kind of have to go with a steady paycheck for a while. <laughs> That's true. Actually, what attracted you to go from ops, though, to technical sales? Great question. Was it b beyond the burnout? Beyond the burnout? Was it, oh, it's the step in the door to where I think I want to go? I I think at the time when, when we were talking about this, you kind of liked the idea of being in sales, but also liked the idea that it would get you in the marketing eventually. So that, that came a little bit later. Um, I'd started thinking about hosting a podcast and, and was starting to put out feelers to, to guest on some, to either guest host or to be kind of a backup host on existing shows. So I was, I was starting to flirt with that idea. And then, um, so at, at that particular time, I was, I was burned out. I was getting ready. I was on, on the job hunt, uh, from yet another company that I'd only been there about six months and if you look at previous episodes of this show, uh, you'll hear me talking about the nightmare that was my last job as a sysadmin and how it was like the poster child for doing everything wrong. But uh, I actually went to uh, DevOps Days Kansas City in, gosh, what would that have been, 2018, I guess? Because I think I got hired on at GitLab at 2019 because that's when I did a lot of conference, conference uh, communication. So, yeah, it must have been fall of 2018. Mm, uh, I think it was tw almost 2017, man. Gosh. But <laughs> well, once again, that, that whole time warp that happened around the 2020, 2021 era. Um, anyway, it, it was it was a year gone by. It was pre-COVID, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was walking around the uh, the hallway track of DevOps Days Kansas City, and I walked up to this one booth with this Fox-looking logo. And, uh, and I recognized this, like, oh, GitLab, this is really cool. Um, and, and so one of the guys manning the booth saw me uh, picking up some stickers. And he goes, hey, so you know what GitLab is? I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is great. We, we, run, uh, we run SaltStack, which is an uh, infrastructure automation tool uh, akin to Puppet or Ansible. And I was like, we, we run SaltStack at, at my job for provisioning new, uh, new systems. And we actually source control all of our, all of our infrastructure as code using, using uh, GitLab. So he and I started talking, and he was a really outgoing guy. And it, it was hard to, to walk away because he, he and I hit it off. Um, and, uh, and Adam was the guy's name. Adam and I got talking. He goes, so, you know, what brings you up to the conference? I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this DevOps thing and I want to see what else is out there. I want to see what the industry is doing. I felt like my career is a little stagnant and he, he kind of d dug into that a little bit. He says, so what have you been doing? And we, we talked about systems administration. I told him, I'm just, I am so sick of putting in all my time and effort just to keep the lights on. I'm so tired of having to be the weekend hero that gets called at two in the morning on a Saturday night and have to fix a database server that no one really cares about until at least 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. I'm so tired of doing this. But this, this company I'm at has the tools to build an automated supply chain using something like GitLab as a source control to then provision and maintain all these servers. And when I ask my, when I ask my leadership, you know, give me give me 60 days or something to focus on nothing but this. Let me see what I can get going. The answer is, well, no, we need you closing out tickets. It's like, well, but that doesn't fix the problem. Because, I mean, how many of us as systems administrators or any position within technology log in and go, look, I have 57 tickets today. Let's, let's see the progress I can make. And you go heads down, you put your headphones in, you got your music playing, and you just work and work and work and work. And 10 hours later, you, you haven't left your desk, your legs are asleep, and you look and go, man, I made some good progress today. Nope, 63 tickets open. It's like, did, did I even show up to work today? What happened? And that's, I mean, that's the life that so many of us live in. And I, I got I got talking to to Adam about this. I'm just I'm like I'm sick of it. I'm tired of being un, I'm tired of being in the trenches. I, I told him I'd kind of rather be off to the side of the field and and helping direct people in a better better path. And he goes, you know what? I don't know. Ex I I, I kind of get a little bit of what brought you here, but I want you to go home tonight, 
put in an application. We've got plenty of positions open. We're growing like crazy. We could use someone with your energy and your experience here at, at GitLab. And so I did. And a few months later, I was working as a solutions architect at GitLab. <laughs> it's like, I don't know anything about a development tool. I don't know anything about technical sales. And the irony was, I never, ever, ever in my life thought I would ever be a, quote, salesman. And now here I was as a solutions architect for GitLab. And uh, it, was, it was just such a crazy change. And uh, it was just such a complete difference of, of work, of, of skill sets that were required uh, to be a solutions architect versus a systems administrator. Before we get into technical marketing, like what did you enjoy the most about it? The was it the um, being able to just go talk to people about these solutions, or was it not the lack of the daily grind? What what was the thing that you really liked about technical sales? Oh, don't get me wrong, there there was plenty of grinding. Oh, it's a different kind a different of grind. Kind of grind for sure. Uh, it wasn't trying to get servers to overcome some random bug that a developer just refuses to update to a newer library. Um, <laughs> but um, there's there's a few things that really, really happened. First of all, at, at the time, GitLab had this amazing growth spurt, and they had this just all this energy. Uh, and they were going to go out, they were going to change the world, they were going to be one tool for your entire development pipeline. That was the vision. And, and GitLab was out there to, to go get it. And uh, so I, I drew on that energy a lot. And anybody that listens to me speak at all knows that when I get on a topic that I'm excited about, I speak faster and louder and I get more animated, even like I am right now, uh, just talking about it. And so just just taking that vision, buying into into the into the goals of, of GitLab really helped. And it was just such a a, such a change of pace because while I still had time where I spent on the command line or logged into the GitLab utility, um, my my quote sysadmin requirements were so ridiculously low because it was just it was very it was very basic uh, type operations that uh, that and it was it was short lived. You basically stand up a, a demo environment. And you give your presentation on XYZ feature, you tell a bit of a story, and you blow that environment away. And the next time you give that presentation, you just spin up a new environment. It was great. I didn't have to make sure things lived more than a few hours. <laughs> just had to make sure the demo worked, because the demo gods will smite you. Oh my you. gosh, we, we recorded an episode <laughs> of End of the Terminal this, on the day we recorded this episode, and it blew up in my face. So yes, the, the demo gods are not grace, gracious at all. They If, if you do not uh, make the proper sacrifices beforehand, it, it does blow up in your face, even if you have two or three backups for your demo. <laughs> At the time of this recording, I haven't published any yet, but finally published the first uh, uh, episodes of Pseudo Labs. All those demos were pre-recorded. <laughs> I will never, ever do a live demo. Uh, so <laughs> I even they were pre-recorded for my recording. <laughs> because <laughs> no i will never do a live demo unless it is requested and required <laughs> I, I've, I've definitely been moving in that direction in fact uh in fact the week that we're recording i'm i've actually got two sessions booked for recording uh my technical sessions for red hat summit uh may 10th and 11th uh free free to register by the way uh shameless plug for for red hat summit but uh, uh but i've actually got two sessions about rel and uh, and for the recording that I'm doing, I've already pre-recorded the screen capture so that all I'm doing for the recording is talking over it. And, and, and that's one of the cool things about doing technical sales or even marketing is you learn different tricks and tips on how to how to present a product or a feature or a workflow in a good light so that it, not not to not to cheat, not to not to outthink the, the demo gods or, or what have you, but but to make sure that when you're trying to teach someone else, and, and back to your back to your question, that was that was something I really enjoyed. Was I love to learn, I love to experiment with technology, and that's that's largely why I got into technology. Was I love to play with things, I love to tinker, I love to build Legos, um, and I can do that with with technology as well. <clears throat> and so, just being able to go and learn something and then write a story around it, um, and I've got ten to twelve years, probably more than that now. Uh, probably close to 15 years of technology experience that I can draw upon and say, hey, 
you know, if I was, uh, you know, like we, we mentioned insights, um, at the, at the top of the show. And it's like, Hey, if I would have had a tool like insights, it would have saved me all this time and all this effort to do a thing. And so you really want to present that in the best light, not to get the sale. Um, but as like the technical salesperson as the conscience, as Brandon calls it, it is so much easier to present a feature or a workflow in a positive light. So you can show people that, Hey, if you use these tools, it, it's not that we're trying to make money off of you. It's we're trying to make your life better. At least that's, that's how I approach sales, which unfortunately that's when the quota kicks in and you actually have to meet certain numbers. And that's, that's what, I think that's what deterred me from, from sales the most. Yeah. That, I think that's what deters most people, but I actually don't mind the targets. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of that challenge, challenge accepted for me, but <laughs> I actually just listening to talk there, I'm going to break the rules of interviewing. I want to put a little, just some words in your mouth a little, maybe, maybe <laughs> not, but what I think attracted you to marketing Go for it. and tell me if I'm right. Cause I like, just listen to you say what you said. You love to teach and like, you like to tell people about your experiences and you like, and you want to show people a better way that you didn't have mm -hmm. marketing definitely gives you that Avenue. I mean, it, 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 de especially being a technical marketer at Red Hat is probably a lot easier than just uh, going and advocating this independently. Mm -hmm. And it gives you that voice, that platform that you wouldn't have otherwise. I think if I had to, knowing as knowing you as well as I know you, that would be my guess of what got you into marketing in the first you know, place. You're, you're absolutely, you, you hit it right on the head because with sales, it's it's so much about the sales cycle. It's so much about meeting quota. And it's like, I cannot spend the amount of time that I wanted to, to really develop that, that relationship, to really dive in on what, what are your problems? What, what is it that keeps you up at night? Because bro, I was, I was, a, I can't believe I just said, bro, I've been hanging around my kids too much, but it's like, come on. I mean, what <laughs> I, I used to be a systems administrator. I know what you're dealing with. So just tell me and let's, let's talk about this. And you know, I, I just, I couldn't find a big enough platform either at, at GitLab or in, in Red Hat to really affect the level of change that I want to see in the, in the industry. And, you know, so much of, of being an influencer, so much of, of being an advocate is, you know, being the example that you want to be or that you want to see in the world. And so moving into the RHEL BU and into marketing, and as we'll talk about at the bottom of the show, my specific role is um is so much different than than what what the job description was to when I applied to this role just because of my passions and my interests and and my specific skill set that that is specific to Eric and no one else has this specific set of experiences or or talents and and so it's not about making an IT guy platform but it 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 definitely helps because you can go out there and say hey I've been there I've seen this I've done this and it sucks we all we can all agree to it so moving from even uh, even technical sales at Red Hat into the RHEL BU has put me into a position where I'm close enough to engineering, where I'm close enough to our, our field, whether that's TAMs who are, are kind of your post-sales advocate and close enough to the solutions architects that are pre-sales, uh, close enough to the community. It's, it's, this, it's this amazing junction between engineering, product management, um, field, TAMs, community, all these different all these different groups of people, and I sit square in the middle of it. So I, I spend so much time on YouTube and Twitter nowadays; it's ridiculous. But but it's I'm in a position where I can affect change. Given your previous experiences, what would you what would you say were the top skills that you learned from uh, being a system admin and a technical seller that has helped you be a more effective to help you be more effective at marketing? So great question. I think one of those I've, I've kind of drilled at a, uh, quite a bit was just experience, being in the trenches, dealing with on-call rotations, missing family dinners because you're sitting out at the car with your with your laptop, your MiFi, and, and your cell phone on speaker trying to fix an issue while everyone else is busy eating their beautifully cooked medium rare steak. Uh, but a lot of experience. Uh, something I draw on a lot more than people, I think, give marketing credit for is my troubleshooting skills. 
Uh, so I'm, my ability to say, okay, if I'm going to if I'm going to do this operation and I come across an error message, being able to drill in and go, okay, I I would expect this to work. So what part of this operation is failing? What part is giving me the 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 issues so that I can either fix it, report it, or work around it to get to my ultimate goal? And so I spent a lot of time, surprisingly enough, on the command line within Red Hat Enterprise Linux troubleshooting. <laughs> Um, so experience um, and, and being a systems administrator, I think one of the other things that I drew from from being a sysadmin was being able to speak the language of a lot of different technology uh, dialects, shall we say, whether that's whether that's management or network engineers or developers, being being able to interface with a large, uh, diverse audience, whether that's whether that's socially or technically, because. Um, all of us work in technology, but not all of us speak the same dialect. You know, it's it's crazy when you go from like Brandon, you're in, you're in telecommunications, and it's it's a completely different dialect than someone who's running just straight rel or straight OpenShift. It's it's a different dialect of the same language, and so being used to translating between different groups and being able to say, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. Let's put all the let's put all the politics, everything else aside, and let's focus on how do we fix this issue. And then technical sales, I think, just gave me experience with technical demos uh, because I can get a little wordy. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, yes, I'm a big can. boy and I can admit that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but understanding that you just like telling a, a good story, you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have to have an antagonist. You have to have a problem you're trying to fix. You have to have a protagonist, which is oftentimes a new feature or a new release or a new product that you're trying to, trying to sell. Um, but moving into marketing, I'm not driven by a sales quota anymore. Um, in fact, a lot of a lot of the metrics that I'm measured by <laughs> have to do with likes and comments and retweets on on social media or on our videos. So, uh, you know, if you could go out and like and subscribe to to the pseudo show uh, and and tag me so that I can say, hey, look, I spent I spent a couple of hours with Brandon, and this is what I have to show for it because that's that's the ridiculous world that I live in nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll appreciate the likes uh, as well, especially the subscribes. M make sure to go subscribe to the new Pseudo Show YouTube channel. Got to get that in. Uh, uh, one thing I'd like to understand as well is someday when I grow up, I might want to move into technical marketing because in some degree, you also do some bit of product management. Some, not a lot. But you you are involved in it because I'd, I'd consider of myself the nature. Of the I'd role. consider myself an advisor or a stakeholder in in product management. So my my opinion when we talk about roadmap and features uh, carries a bit of weight just because of my interaction between the field and customers. Um, and I take that back. Um, so I I wouldn't say I have I, don't, I wouldn't say I do any product management, but I'm definitely uh, a. a almost like a consultant to, to a lot of our product managers. Yeah. You're, you're in the process is mm -hmm. really what it comes right down to. So whether that's a technical marketing role or a product management role, what would you recommend a skill that someone work on that would be interested in a technical marketing focus role or, and again, or even a product management role? So let me, let me define the three positions that I work with the most. I, th I think that might help color our conversation a little bit. So there's the product marketing manager known as a PMM. Um, the product marketers are the people that come up with the sort of the voice of the product. They, they are closer to the vision, closer to the mission goals of a product. Um, it's one thing to have a product that does X, Y, Z, but it's another thing to have a product that has an end goal. Um, you know, if, let's take a generic example like self-driving cars we we can have self-driving cars but if they don't have a mission of what if someone's what if someone's blind or what if what if we won't, what if our goal is to reduce the number of fatalities when it comes to driving cars what is that mission what is that vision for this product so a self-driving car would be to then spread the number of self-driving cars on the road so that computers uh, with a thousand different cameras are are monitoring the road, the weather conditions, and other cars, 
and making decisions much quicker and much less distracted than a person can. So a product marketing manager is more interested in the vision and the voice of the product. Um, a lot of the a lot of the kind of the storytelling usually comes from the product marketing position. So that's the PMM. And then on the on the other side of the fence, you have the product managers, the PMs, and the product managers are more. Uh, there's a lot of project management involved. There's a lot of capacity planning. There's a lot of telling feature stories. So in, in the DevOps world, you hear a lot about telling telling feature stories of we want to write we want to write code that does a thing, but who's going to care about the thing unless we have a use case for it? So if we want to have a feature that um, you know, if if we want to have a feature that automatically deploys updates when they're available. You know, it's it's all well and good for us to go out and write a feature that does a thing, but why is anyone going to care? So a product uh, a product manager goes in and and kind of writes some of those stories and gives legs to the engineers that actually write the code, and then right in the middle of that triangle, uh, or actually one of the points of that triangle would be the technical marketing manager, which is the role that I hold here at Red Hat. And quick disclaimer that. Your company or your vendor may may have different definitions or different titles for these. This this is speaking from a Red Hat perspective, um, and specifically a Red Hat Enterprise Linux perspective. But a technical manager sits sits at the point of those of those two positions to um, to take the story, to take the feature, and give it legs. Writing demos, writing blogs, uh, doing live streams. Uh, producing the demos that then your sales team would go out and present on on that automatic update feature. Um, so we, we do a lot of the technical writing for for these features and new releases as they come out. Yeah, the, the titles may be different, but the uh, the roles are the same right. at other vendors. Yeah, you define the, the roles. What about the skills? Mm -hmm. Like if someone had to, if you had to pick one or two key skills, what would you say someone that's interested in these roles specific uh, take it from uh, the perspective someone that's already in a technical field that you know they're already technically savvy but they need a that you would say that someone that is technically savvy needs to focus on so i have never in my entire career been in a more skill hungry position in my entire career um the, the number of skills and tools that I work with on a regular basis is unbelievable. I'm not, I'm not saying that to discourage anyone, but if, if you were wired for a technical marketing position, I think you would draw a lot of energy from that. Um, Brandon often asks me how work's going. It's just like, I'm exhausted, but I love what I do. Um, like right now, we're right in the middle of summit prep season. We're right in the middle of uh, release planning for RHEL 9. Um, I'm doing some some community focused events. I've got two live streams and spinning up a third here this summer. Um, so just the number of skills and tools that I interface with on a weekly basis is unbelievable. Uh, the number of tabs I end up open on a regular day is just crazy. Uh, and, and again, I don't say that to be discouraging. I say that because if that's something that interests you, I think I don't know what you would call that as a skill. But if you have that desire to not be siloed, to not be locked into any anything in particular, um, this is a great way to do it. Um, I think kind of kind of starting broad and getting more specific. I think uh, uh, another another trait or another attribute maybe would be uh, to be a generalist, uh, <clears throat> because yeah, I may support Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but even when you zoom in to just that level. There is so much to talk about, whether you're talking about the install experience, the upgrade experience, whether you're talking about day-to-day -day operations, whether you're talking about uh, deploying different workloads, whether you're talking about containers versus RPMs, whether you're talking about releases, whether you're talking about security or automation and system roles. Um, there's just so much to cover within just this product. And like I've, I've never been a developer, and that's not been something I've been drawn to. So when it comes to talking about some of the development libraries, I'm not well equipped to speak to that. I, I know some of the highlights for RHEL 9 and what's coming for developers, but fortunately we've got multiple uh, technical marketing managers who can handle that. So being a generalist really helps. Um, having, having that desire to learn is definitely one. 
um, I've, I've interviewed at companies that don't value learning as, as a skill, but if you know how to learn and if you are hungry to learn, you'll do well in marketing, especially when you consider that like I'm, I'm the release TMM for, for Red Hat right now. So for RHEL 8.5 and 8.6 that's coming out and RHEL 9 that's coming out, I'm, I'm the guy that's developing the what's new content. Um, and I'm the one hosting the podcasts and the live streams that are talking about what's new. So you can't just you can't just come in and learn all the security things and say, cool, I'm done. Because that's not how it works. Because six months from now, we're, we're going to have another release with no security features, new automation around security. There's just so much to learn. Eric, it's been a lot of fun to have you back on. I, uh, I know we're going to be doing another here pretty soon talking about RHEL 9. Just a little hint. Yeah, don't don't be a stranger even after that. I'm not far away. I'm I'm still uh, I still hang out in our matrix room and I I try and jump in on conversations whenever I can. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not far away. And and still, uh, even though I'm not on here every every episode, I still highly encourage you if you if you have any questions, if you if you want to know more about Red Hat, about Rel, about technical marketing, or ways to give Brandon a hard time. Uh, on on Hangouts, by all means, you know, reach out to me. I'm not hard to find, and that's by design. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of the pseudo show, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at, at pseudo show podcast. You can catch more awesome content over our network partners, destinationlinux.network. You can support the show on Patreon at pseudo.show slash Patreon. There'll be a link in the show notes. Eric, anywhere you'd like to send our listeners? For sure. Uh, you can follow me at itguyeric.com or on social media, pretty much any platform you can find. I'm there at itguyeric. Uh, as well as uh, if you're looking for a live stream show, join the Red Hat Enterprise Linux YouTube channel. Subscribe there to, to get the schedule of upcoming events. Uh, also, Red Hat has a growing uh, matrix room as well. Uh, I don't have the URL or I don't have the address off the top of my head, but I'll make sure to to get that over to Brandon to include in the show notes. You can follow me on most social media at dbrandonjohnson or my website at open-tech.net and new content at destinationlinux.network. Thank you for listening to the pseudo show where business meets open source. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>